That's okay. <laughs> Thank you, sister. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. <laughs> she also teaches the first year experience courses. Professor Stuart Moore holds a BA in liberal arts from California State University and a master of education from the University of State St. Thomas. She has an elementary school certification as well as a reading specialist certification and has taught at the elementary level for five years. Professor Stuart Moore loves swimming, reading, and spending quality time with her family. Her favorite quote is live life to the fullest. Professor Miguel Burke, after working for Lone Star College since 2002, Professor Burke joined Lone Star College site there as a first year experience professor last fall. In addition to teaching EDEC classes at various LSC campuses since 2011, he spent 15 years working in public education teaching English. English is a second language and special ed. Prior to his journey into education, he worked as an editor and freelance journalist for a number of international entertainment publications. Professor Burke earned his Bachelor of Arts in Broadcast Journalism from Howard University and completed his Master of Education degree in Educational Technology and Leadership at Lamar University. With a passion for serving the community, Professor Burke enjoys creating impactful relationships with students while inspiring them to attain success. In his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his family, making music, DJing, going to concerts, traveling, kayaking, archery, and watching movies. I'm envious. <laughs> one of his famous quotes, two girls diverged in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Robert Frost. Professor Valerie Jefferson migrated to Texas from Illinois in 2012 with degrees in criminal justice, adult education, higher education, and counseling. Professor Jefferson is a certified student success instructor with more than 15 years of experience in higher ed, including student services, supervision, and teaching and training. With additional experience with curriculum development, counseling, and advising students on academic related issues. Her number one passion is student success. Having taught first year experience courses for over a decade, she loves working with first year students, providing them with support and assistance as they transition to college. Professor Jefferson strives to assist students to continue to pursue their passions. Professor Je uh, Jefferson, excuse me, enjoys spending time outdoors, working on her, her container home project, and raising her backyard chickens. I'm impressed. <laughs> impressed by all of our kids. One of her favorite quotes is, education is the most powerful weapon, which you can use to change the world. Nelson Mandela said so. And lastly, but not leastly, Professor Shamim Arastu. Professor Arastu currently serves as department chair of education, first year experience. She has been in the field of education for over 22 years. She advises our future professional educators club and humanitarian connection. Professor Arastu is passionate about guiding students to think and act with the lens of serving others and encourages them to become global thinkers and doers. Her courses provide students innovative opportunities deeply rooted in service and global education. Professor Rostu enjoys the outdoors, traveling, and sharing new experiences, adventures with her new family, with her family, excuse me. One of her famous quotes is the teacher who is indeed wise does not bid you to enter the house of his wisdom, but rather leads you to the threshold of your mind. Okay, so without further ado, Professor Jefferson will now speak about You Belong, Navigating the Process. <clears throat> Professor Jefferson. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I'm going to start off, I'm going to ask you guys to repeat after me. I'm going to throw a question out to you, and I want you to repeat it back to me, okay? It's, where do I belong? I'll do it. We'll do it. Where do I belong? Where do I belong? Okay, good. I have to make sure you're here with me. All right. All right. Understand that you belong here at Lone Star College. All right. 
If you are a student that has a goal, a dream, a passion, a desire to do something and become someone, you're in the right place. You're here at Lone Star College. Today, we're gonna to engage in a discussion, a dialogue about student success. We're gonna talk specifically about African-American student success in college. And I'm gonna explain one of the reasons why we're doing that here today. But we're gonna talk about African-American student success and uh, helping and assisting our African-American students reach their goals and they, their dreams that they've set for themselves, okay? So some of you might be wondering why this topic. If we were to research the term African-American student success in college, much of the literature will reflect that African-American students tend to have low retention, low persistence, and low graduation rates from college. The things that myself and my colleagues are gonna talk about today are gonna to apply to all students, all right? The strategies that we talk about are things that everyone can implement to help them be successful. But when we talk about some of these things, we're gonna be talking specifically to or about African-American students, but know that everyone can take something from this presentation as well, okay? So by a show of hands, how many of you guys know someone who's stopped out or dropped out of college? Quite a few. So all of us. So what are some of the reasons why those students dropped out of college or students might drop, reasons why they might? Just give me a couple. Yes. No money. All right. Lack of funds, finances. What else? Yes. Children. Children. All right. Children and other personal responsibilities. Anyone else? Yes. Couldn't keep their grades up. Couldn't keep their grades up. Having difficulty performing academically. Yeah. Yeah, and that's hard for a lot of students, right? Trying to find that balance, right? Especially when you need to eat, to live, to survive, right? Any others? Yes. Yeah, support is a huge issue for a lot of students. Yes, that's true. Transportation, we could probably go down a whole list of other reasons why students tend to drop out or stop out of college. Well, many African-American students probably have some of those same issues. Right, but they also, uh, that may cause them to stop out or drop out of college. But there's also some unique experiences that African-American students might have over others. And I'm gonna talk about some of those uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. But the term that one researcher uses is called cultural tensions, right? Which basically talks about the students' um, ability, the students kind of struggling with their identity, and their sense of belonging at the academic institution, okay? And again, that's something unique that many African-American students might experience, okay? But I'm gonna come back to those, those, uh, those three tensions, those three tensions that she talks about specifically in a few moments, and, and we'll talk about those more in detail when I talk about things that instructors might wanna be aware of when they're um, interacting or working with African-American students, okay? Well, we all agree that when we come here, we all come as who we are. We bring ourselves into this environment. Myself as an instructor, I bring all of my stuff with me, right? Do you bring who you are when you come to campus, your background, your experiences in life, your experience in higher or in secondary or elementary education, right? You bring all of that cultural capital with you in the classroom, yeah? You think that's true? Okay. So as African-American students, we need to learn how to navigate the process of higher education, right? And take all of that, what Jane Elliott and people term that cultural knapsack, all that cultural capital, bring it in here, be proud of all you got right, and take it to help catapult you and help you to be successful as a student, okay? Learn how to use what you have, all right, to help you to reach your goals and reach your dreams and navigate through that process. And we can talk a little bit more about that in the question and answer session if need to, all right? I'm gonna share a little bit about my story 
tell you what was in my cultural knapsack when I went off to college my first year and what all I brought with me and some things that I did, some strategies that I used as a student. And we share with our students too, a lot in need of 1500, these very same things. Some of you might be shocked. They might be new and revelationary. Feel free to take pictures of them and share them. You can sell whoever will buy them if you want. But I'm the child of a 15 year old mother and an 18-year-old father who didn't graduate from high school. If I followed the path of statistics, I shouldn't have graduated from high school. I probably shouldn't have gone to college, and I definitely shouldn't be here talking to you today. Okay. But I took everything that I had to help me to get through. Everything that I was taught, all of my experiences, helped me to build that resistance, become resilient, and persist through my education. That first year of college, it was not a straight path. I'm not gonna go into detail what it was like, but it just wasn't, okay? And so I had to learn to tap into resources and things within my environment. And those things are people or individuals or some people that are sitting right here in this room today, okay? Many of you will probably see some of these strategies. We talk about them in our Education 1300 classes and they may seem simple in theory, but they work. Goals, having a goal for yourself, right? If you don't have a goal, you don't know where you're going, how are you gonna plan it, right? So sitting down and doing some self-reflection and understanding what it is that you want, playing out how you're gonna get there, definitely making those connections with professors and staff members here at the college and the institution and other students as well are valuable to you as well getting involved in the campus, participating in clubs and activities, even if it's the free pizza and the t-shirt, right? Taking advantage of those opportunities to interact and get to know people. Studies show that when you get involved, you interact and you engage, you're more likely to stay and be retained. You're more likely to feel a part of that environment and connect, okay? Again, here's that path, right? to success. Most people think that it looks like that, but in reality, you hit a lot of roadblocks and stumbles and obstacles and all kinds of things, right? When you're trying to pursue a goal or trying to achieve something. The most important thing, as I said earlier, is asking for help. Right? Evaluating and knowing where you are, if things aren't working and you need some help and assistance, going to your professors, going to the staff, or the various student support services and asking for help to help you get to where it is that you want to go, help you accomplish and achieve what it is that you want to accomplish, all right? So you can pull out your phone and take a screenshot if you want, because those are life-saving tips right there, all right? Creating that space of belonging. Some things my professors did as a result of making those connections with them, they approached me when I needed help. English, kind of shame to say, is not my thing, <laughs> okay? But when I didn't perform well on my English paper, my professor saw that. She came to me and she helped me, gave me some assistance, some guidance on what I needed to do and how I needed to do it better, all right? She encouraged me to go to the writing lab, which I did, all right? So that I can improve my grade in that class, all right? My instructors knew me by name. Sometimes even when I called, they knew who was called. All right. They knew my by name and uh, they acknowledged me, acknowledged my existence. And many of them, a couple of them in particular, acted as my mentor. My criminal justice professor um, was actually um, my letter of recommendation to grad school. All right. And so all of those things are important to make connections and pull a student in and let them be visible and seen within the academic environment. And then lastly, really quickly, those cultural tensions that I talked about. For instructors and staff at the college and the institution, know that the African-American student experience is different. It's different because we experience some of those common stressors that everybody else does dealing with transportation, finances, you know, trans uh, uh, children, um, all those things, right? Trying to juggle work-life balance, all those things. In school, but this these cultural tensions are unique 
to minority students, right? And I'm gonna talk about each one of those. <laughs> the first one is authenticating blackness. Authentic authenticating blackness basically means that a student is struggling with being too black or not black enough, right? Oftentimes students will see seeking education as a white thing because it's not something that's normal as a part of their culture. And I was thinking, I was reflecting with Professor Arastu, and I was thinking about my grandparents and how um, when my uncles and my aunts were getting older and graduating from high school, they were like, where are you going to get a job at? Their first thought was in college, right? Where are you going to work at so you can get out and survive, right? And so that's the first one, being Black and not Black enough. The second one is the acculturative loss, right? Where a student feels that they are, they're losing a part of who they are when they come into this environment, which kind of relates to the first one, right? You, you, you can be too black and, and not enough black, okay? And then lastly, this other one is kind of deeply rooted in black culture, that connection with family, that connection with our communities, right? You're going out and you're leaving your culture, your community, and going into another one, right? And then within this culture, within this community, um, you still have a responsibility. You're going to college and you're representing the whole, right? And within that whole, very many students still may not have others within their families or within their communities that are off going to college like they are. Okay, so they're dealing with, again, those tensions oftentimes. So lastly, again, these factors combined with some of the other ones that we mentioned before um, may cause a negative impact on a student's performance in higher education, their sense of belonging and connectedness while they're there, and students ultimately may opt to stop out or drop out of college um, as a whole. Okay. And so again, earlier I alluded to this relationship the relationship between the institution and the students, right? So I think we all have a part to play in this whole, this whole process. We do our part, they do their part, and vice versa. And for students, we're gonna get rid of this question. We're just gonna say, I belong, because we have the resources and the tools here to help you get to wherever you need to go. Oh, yes. So now Professors Arastu and Stuart Moore will now address uh, pedagogy and best practices. Thank you, Professors. Okay. It's harder to see from far away. I don't know if you can see the diagram, but um, so this kind of ties a little bit or a lot to what Professor Jefferson was talking about in terms of this knapsack, right? That a student brings to campus, right? We bring what we see here on this diagram, which is called the cultural iceberg, okay? What you notice on top of the water is our surface culture, right? It's the things that are kind of obvious, the music, what we see in terms of dress, right? Um, what's visible to the eye, okay? And then we've got our deep-rooted culture, okay? And I don't know if you can see these, but we've got communication styles and rules of communication, right? Do we look people in the eye, people of authority in the eye when we're talking to them or do we look down? How does all that manifest when we come into the classroom in this other environment, right? That's different from where we are when we're at home, okay? Um, notions of courtesy and manners, friendship, leadership, beauty, concepts of time, family, self, past, future, what's fair, what's just, these are all part of what we call deep culture, okay? Including attitudes, right? How do we view age? How do we, uh, you know, uh, view, view authority figures, okay? And then in this area, we've got approaches to religion, raising children, how do we make decisions? All of these are part of that knapsack that you bring, okay? Or that our students are bringing into the higher education environment. So it's important to understand, right? 
that students enter with cultural filters. And as Professor Jefferson said, these things are applicable to all students. They're universal in that sense, but each student has their own individuality and their own lens which which they view, okay, um, things. They, they have their own individual deep culture that they're bringing, right? And so for, for students, it's important to recognize, recognize your, your deep culture recognize what that looks like and what that manifests when you are in your classroom environment, right? What kind of barriers are you gonna to have to overcome as a result of what you're carrying and how you view things? Does that make sense, All right? So you have to recognize that so that you know when you need to ask for help. You know who you need to ask for help, right? And you know that maybe it'll take you an extra effort to do that. Maybe you need a friend to encourage you to do that because that's just you know, the, the um, environment that you're coming from. It's not easy for you. Does that make sense, right? So for students, I'm emphasizing this because you need to recognize where you are and what you're bringing, own it, right? Own those strengths and know how to use them. And if you don't, you, that's where you ask for that help. Right? And then for faculty, it's important to empathize, understand, right? The key is understand. And if you don't know, besides what the surface culture is, that's when you dive deeper. Then you connect with those students and you find out, you know, what kind of attitudes do they share? What are those students' experiences that they're bringing into this classroom? What can they share with the rest of the class, right? Um, and even in recognizing what that student may need, right? You've got to understand the deeper culture, right? So I wanted to share that because I think that's very, very important. Um, Erica, do you want to share a quote? Yes, I, I absolutely love this quote because it, it represents who I was as a elementary school kid, middle school, high school. But kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I see this with my kids. I see this with even my college students. So we're going to talk a little bit more about how this quote impacts students, um, really making that connection for them to let them know that you do care about them, that they're not just some number, that they have a name, they have a background, they have a story. Absolutely. And <clears throat> I, I can just share a personal narrative of mine from, this is when I was teaching in K through 12. Um, but I connected with a student that I taught in my first year, and I'm not going to give the date because that'll really, that'll date myself, but it's been, it's been over 20 years, right? And Facebook can bring a lot of people together. So I connected with a student who I taught in my first year of teaching um, about two years ago, um, and it was just kind of neat to see where uh, the student particularly had been and all his experiences. And one of the things he shared in the conversation, he was like, you know, uh, Miss Arustu, that's what he would call me, Miss A. Um, one of the things that was the most memorable that I really appreciated and I never told you back then was when you came to pick us up to go to Darian's funeral. And I, I was just very surprised when he said that to me. And he said, I, I would have never thought a teacher would come to my home and pick me up and then go attend another student's funeral and bring us back. And we sat and we talked and we debriefed about it. And he said that was just so meaningful. And in my mind, I didn't even think about that, that I was doing anything out of the ordinary. You know, unfortunately, we had lost a student that we all, you know, he was in, he was one of my students. And um, it was just like a natural thing. We didn't really think about lawsuits back then, I guess, maybe, <laughs> that we can't go pick up a student, but that's what, you know, that's what I had done. And I just thought it was so powerful because it reminded me how important making those connections are. It was just a really good reminder that, wow, maybe sometimes you don't think about that extra minute you're going to give a student and connect with them and know, hey, what's going on in your life or, you know, what have you been through this week that's going to be impactful and something that they take with them, right? And it may help change their course, right? So building those relationships is powerful, right? And I want to make that point. Um, is that it takes two people, right? As a student, you have to take that ownership. So you've got to own it, right? 
And as a professor, as a faculty member, that's part of our responsibility, right? That's what we do. As a human, that's what you should do, right? You reach out to that student. But I wanna stress that with students, especially because that's always hard, right? Right. Sometimes you may not see it from your instructor, but don't let that stop you. You reach out. You reach out. Don't hesitate to take that first step. So I wanted to share that. Um, and that's part of that building relationships and making those connections. Right. You can initiate and you can own it. OK. These are just two, um, actually two pioneers in culturally responsive teaching. And when we talk about culturally responsive teaching, right, we talk about understanding where people are coming from, right, understanding their backgrounds. Um, and so from the instructor lens, right, uh, that's where these definitions are coming from. But culturally relevant teaching is a way to empower students, right, intellectually, socially, emotionally, and politically by using cultural reference to impart knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So as instructors, we have to keep those deep cultures in our mind and try to incorporate, try to bring understanding when we are teaching whatever subject matter it is that we're teaching. We have to keep those things in perspective. That's what culturally responsive teaching is about, right? And I'll go over some examples um, as to what that would look like in a classroom, right? And then um, when academic knowledge and skills are situated within the lived experiences and frames of reference for students, they are more personally meaningful, they have higher interest appeal, and are learned more easily and thoroughly, right? And that's just part of science, right? If you connect with the material, right, you're more likely to uh, remember it and retain that information, right? Um, so bringing in experiences, uh, bringing in interests of your students, right? And on the student side, you sharing, sharing your voice, sharing your experiences, right? That's very, very important. Any questions? Okay, cultural and responsive pedagogy and best practices. I'm gonna talk about storytelling, culture of narr narration of storytelling. This can be such, for this is for faculty, but this could be such a powerful tool to help African-American students feel like they belong, that feel like they are, are supposed to be there, they feel engaged and connected. Um, I'm gonna reflect just even on my own personal K through 12 experience. I absolutely had a great experience elementary school. I love my teachers, can remember my teacher's names, one of my second grade teachers said, you're such a good reader. Why don't you go ahead and read to the kindergartners, read to the first graders? So it built my confidence. But then when I got to middle school and high school, something happened. It was a complete disconnect. And I, reflecting back, I, can, I know what happened now. But when I was in it, I didn't, I didn't understand. And so it wasn't until I got to college that I had my first Black professor. And that was a game changer because honestly, in high school, my grades did not reflect my capability. I was capable of A's, but I did not make A's. I made C's, I made D's because I did not, number one, I did not, I wasn't, didn't feel connected. It goes back to that quote, I didn't feel like my teachers cared about me. I didn't feel like my teachers uh, were concerned about my well-being. So I didn't work hard for them. I just said, forget it, I'm not gonna try. I also struggled with fear of failure. I went to a predominantly white school throughout elementary and then in middle school and high school, a little bit more diverse. But I remember my first African-American professor and he was my sociology press professor. And he did such a great job of storytelling. There's some of his stories that I still remember today that I share with my students because number one, it resonated with me. I felt like I could connect. These are real life experiences. The problem with high school is I felt like I didn't belong. I felt like this isn't this material, I'm not gonna need it in the future. It's not practical, it's not, it doesn't benefit me. And so I think about our ancestors, African-American ancestors, and how they use storytelling to pass down information, words of wisdom from generation to generation. That's how wisdom was passed down from our grand, great, great grandparents and some of the stories that I tell to my kids, and I hope that they'll tell to their kids. 
And so I use storytelling in my classroom. I usually talk about my own personal example. My students, some of my students are here with me uh, about how I failed uh, high school uh, algebra. And when I got to college, you know, light bulb came on and I started tutoring and I started really putting myself out there and giving 100% because for me, I did have a fear of failure. I had a fear of failure knowing what if I give 150% and it's still not good enough? What does that mean for me? Because I always felt like I wasn't start smart enough. I wasn't good enough. And it just felt like the professors, the teachers did not validate me. And so part of some of the responsive pedagogy for professors is really bringing in stories. And not that you have to make up stories. You can bring in African-American authors, whether you teach writing, whether you teach history. I never saw myself in the curriculum in K through 12. It wasn't until I got to college that I said, oh, there's other people that look like me. And so that had a huge significance on me. And so for professors, having that storytelling, bringing in African-American authors, guest speakers, that can go a long way for students who now say, I'm not sure if I want to try college, but wow, I see other authors being represented in the curriculum. Um, Shamit, Professor Ross is going to talk about gamify. So gamification is a way to be culturally responsive. It is uh, something that university can be done in all classes, and it's very, very important. It does uh, lend itself to cultures that are very collaborative, that are very social, right? And that's my understanding that African-American culture is very family-oriented, very social. They, they build on um, interactions, right? And so gamification is a great way, you know, introduce a topic. Um, use assessment, uh, use a game as an assessment tool. Find ways to create some healthy competition in the classroom to cover content material. Um, and it's a great way to bring those aspects of culture into the classroom. And all of this, the gamify, I'm a very competitive person by nature. And I really believe it goes back to our roots. Like it, it is, can build collaboration in the classroom. So I know we do this a lot K through 12, but as Professor Ross do, it, collaborating, having your students have discussions and talk about controversial topics. This all builds social engagement in the classroom. And I think for me, going back to high school, why was I checked out is because I didn't find the material relevant. And so if you're an instructor, if you're a professor, if you can make the material relevant to how these students, African-American students can apply this to real life, how it's gonna benefit them, that's gonna help with that social engagement in the classroom. And so some of the best practices that I try to implement in my classroom is knowing my students' names. Now, I, they'll tell you, it's taken a few weeks because I'm getting older now, but I used to, the first week I used to have everybody's name and now it's like week four, I'm like, okay, tell me your name again. Um, but it does something, when somebody says my name out loud, they're, they're validating who I am. And it just goes a long way. So knowing your students' names, um, also not singling them out. I think I could recall a middle school teacher that said I wasn't gonna do anything with my life because I did check out. I, I was capable, but I checked out. And so if you have some of your students that stop, start missing classes or not turning in their assignments, have a connection with them, have a conference with them and see what's going on. And don't single them out and just say, oh, Johnny, come up to the front. But what I did the third week, I teach the first year experience and we have a path to success paper. So I conference with all my students. So that gives me an opportunity to check in with them and see how's it going? How are you doing in your other classes? What are some things that you need help with? And so it builds that camaraderie, that connection that they know I care about them. So that's a simple, just best practice. Um, explicit instructions, sometimes as instructors, we get it, but our students don't get it the first time. And so really trying to differentiate your teaching style, because not always our teaching style matches their learning style. So if you can differentiate their, your teaching style and show it different ways, that's going to help students to be able to have those instructions that they need to, you know, be successful with that assignment. And if I can just chime mm -hmm. in really uh, real quick, something that's very helpful for explicit instructions, break it down so that you are, you are uh, you know, you're breaking it down in the most amount of detail. So right. that it can help maybe the student that needs the most information, right? Whereas maybe another student might just skim through it and need like a couple of directions. Right. And you can always give it to a student beforehand and say, hey, does this make sense to you? 
And that gives you the best idea of, hey, do I need to break, are the directions clear enough? Because what we think and what we perceive is not what students think and perceive. And I think that's why I always felt like I wasn't smart enough because my processing time was a little slower. Sometimes I could get it in certain subjects, but sometimes it took a little bit longer. That doesn't mean I wasn't as smart as my peers. It just took me a little bit longer to understand and grasp that concept. So as a teacher, sometimes I try to say things in different ways and make sure they understand it's to the overboard to the point. Um, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Storytelling. 15 minute conversation, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think we covered everything. Yes. All right. So we're just going to move on to <laughs> Professor Burke. Thank you very much. Professor Burke will now speak about from I Soup to I Belong. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I just want to tell y'all first what a fabulous looking group you guys are. Give yourselves a hand. I'm going to get you out of the way. Give it up to my fabulous teammates. I don't know if you're more passionate. Okay, so um, my name is Miguel Burke. Okay, uh, I have been teaching EDUC since 2011, but I, I, I finally got the opportunity to teach here at Sci Fair full time, and I love it, y'all. I love it. Okay, and so what I'm going to talk about today is going from I too to I belong. Okay, y'all said that word. I too I to I belong. All right, so uh, we're going to get none other than um, one of my favorites, Denzel Washington, to read this poem for you guys. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> Can you click the video? I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> my tech skills are limited. That's why I'm I can't even use this clicker. Right? <laughs> I am the doctor. Bro. And I eat well and I grow strong. Tomorrow I'll set at the table with company gum. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen bed. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am a member. Okay, so we're gonna go to I too, from I too to I belong. But I kind of have a different way of doing this. And so I need y'all support. I need some energy. Can y'all do that for me? Okay. This is what we're gonna do. I need y'all just clap. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hello. Here we go. Repeat after me. From I to I will. Let's see. We got a going on. From I to. I belong. I belong. LSC. LSC. Where I belong. Where I belong. Give y'all some hand. Thank y'all for doing that. Okay. Uh, wow. I bet y'all didn't expect to come and, and start rapping and everything and, and make beats. Okay. Uh, but what we have done, did you know we just made some type of performance art? Did you know that? Okay. And so, um, I'm going to just talk about hip hop for me. I love it. It's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And the thing that I love about it so much is it was something that was created from nothing. I want you guys to use your imagination and think about this. It was created in the Bronx, August 11, 1973. Now, the way that the Bronx was described was like a wasteland. Okay? That is the actual. Uh, flyer from the first hip hop party, okay? And it looked like a wasteland. And in this wasteland, uh, there was, I'm, I'm sure, hope and everything. I mean, there was poverty, there were drugs, there was violence. But somebody said, you know what? I love music. And they took the spirit of vision and said, you know what? I'm gonna have this party. But the way I'm gonna do that is, I'm not a musician, but I need to keep 
Uh, my favorite parts of these records repeated, right? Because that's what we love. That's what we get the energy from. And so what uh, they had the idea to do was take two records and two turntables and add them to a mixer and repeat those records to make a loop. And then somebody said, hey, you know what? I need somebody to interact with the crowd. And they grabbed the mic and they started doing a rhythmic chain, okay? And that is the beginning of rap. Right now, let me tell you why I love it. Because it's something from nothing, okay? And like most things in African American culture, it was derived out of uh, hardship. It was derived out of poverty. It was derived out of inequality, okay? And so, um, what I'm encouraging all of you guys to do here is to tap into that same spirit that our forefathers had, right? This is the same spirit that. Um, where slaves learn how to read when they weren't supposed to by candlelight. This is also the same spirit that um, this uh, Ursula Burns embraced when she started out as an intern and then she became a CEO of Xerox. Anybody ever heard of Xerox? Okay, so, and not, not only that, but she, came to, she became the first African-American CEO of a Fortune 500 company, right? So I'm telling the students here to tap into that spirit because that's how you go from I to I belong. You ride that spirit of innovation and inventiveness and you see where it takes you and you know the road may be hard, but then anything that's worth having in life is not gonna be easy. It's not gonna come to you easy. How many people, if, if you don't mind share with me, how many of y'all are first time in college students? Man, y'all are awesome, okay. How many of you guys are the first ones in your family to attend college? That is beautiful. You know why? And this is just not for the African American students, this is for everybody. You're going from I to the I belong. You are in the process of changing the whole trajectory of your family history. I'm going to repeat that. You are in the process of changing the whole trajectory of your family history. Right? You are making the best investment that one can make in themselves. Education. Nobody can take that away from you, right? So part of going from I to the I belong is to tap in that spirit, right? It's there. Okay. Um your great your journey to greatness starts here at Lone Star College. Y'all with me? All right. Let's talk about affirmation through representation. Okay, so forgive me for my uh, popular culture references. I figured y'all would say what I'm saying. How many of y'all watch Marvel movies? Okay, good, good, good. Okay, so one of the things that Marvel said that they want to do is that they want to make movies where everybody's represented. Okay? And you, you know about the enormous box office gross. They want doing something right. Okay, so I, I'm asking you, as professors, why can't we take that same approach and do it in the classroom with our content, with our discipline, right? Um, who you have up here is uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, okay? And uh, I'm gonna just be honest with you. The picture on the right was my son, okay? And he had to dress up as him, right? So I'm cheating a little bit, but uh, it, was, it was awesome, right? And uh, when you see on the bottom at the left, the CNN clip, um, that is a young man that graduated high school at nine years old. He started college. Guess what he wants to be? An astrophysicist. Wow. Right? Now, growing up, that was not in my lexicon. That wasn't in my vocabulary, being an astro. I didn't know what it was. Okay? But uh, thanks to Neil deGrasse Tyson, these kids, you know, these students here know who they are. How many people know who this gentleman is right here? All right, that's in, that's in our cultural lexicon now, right? So what I'm going to ask all our professors to do is like, we're already wonderful. We're working with these students, right? Y'all are taking care of these students. If you're here, you're in the right place. Your heart's in the right place. Let's see what we can do to create more um, content that has a natural integration of African Americans. After we do that, let's go for our Hispanic students and our Asian students and so on and so forth, right? Because everybody, like the superheroes, 
needs to see some type of representation of themselves, right? Do you know that every time you pass by a traffic light, it was invented by, I believe his name is Garrett Warden. He came up with a patent with a three single traffic light. What about, uh, I can't remember her name, but it was a, a female African-American inventor. She invented the, the, the technology for the gift file. Anybody use gift files? Oh, I, I use them all the time, right? So, um, I mean, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. So why are we not bringing this in mainstream? We live in a culture where we celebrate our differences, right? And so that's one of the ways that I think as professors that we can do that, right? And I, I don't think it's hard, right? Okay, why else should we do it? Because it's a family affair, right? So unfortunately, we have a little problem with the data for African-American students. But we didn't fight together, right? We're gonna change that. Okay, and so um, one of the most beautiful things about Lone Star is it's in our LSC faculty qualities of excellence, right? It's also, uh, you see how it says a grace and diversity in all its forms, right? It's also um, just everywhere you look at Lone Star, it is here, okay? And uh, something I would like to kind of tell you about that, that may have impact on me. And I don't know if she knows this, but our president here, Dr. Valerie Jones, a while ago she sent an email out. Okay. And uh, in this email, she's talking about how we need to recover from COVID and how we need to just kind of get back to normal. And she's hoping we can do that. And then she talked about going to the movies. And she said that the movie that she wanted to see most was The Woman King. Right? Anybody seen that? And I was like, whoa. <laughs> whoa. That like, it was, it was a connection for me. And y'all, I'm usually the kind of person, I mind my business, and I don't say anything, I'm probably gonna stay in that corner. That's just who I am, right? But I felt compelled enough to email her and say, oh, I've seen that movie twice. It was so good, I had to take my mom to see, right? And my dad. And uh, I felt seen, right? So it's just amazing the type of stuff uh, where you, you can use these, these things that are universal, uh, to connect with our students. Every class that I start my, my, with my students, we start with a song of the day, okay? We, 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 get, we get our little groove on. And the other thing I do is tell them about my weekend. And then we talk about TV shows. Who saw this? Oh, yes, yeah, right? And I engage my students that way, okay? The last point that I want to make is uh, actually two more points. Um, these are all of our students. Yes, they're African American, that's their skin color, that's their culture, that's their heritage, right? This is, these are everybody's students, right? Because I guarantee you, you're gonna have a couple of African American students in your class, and as professor, that's where we need to go. That's bro, excuse me. That's where the data says that we need to improve our performance, right? And we're trying to keep everybody African Americans and other students, right? It's a family affair, okay? Uh, and so um, that is for our professors, we can use that as an identified area of growth because that's where, you know, we're a little bit behind on, on in, in the game, right? Okay, and so uh, it's our system-wide focus to improve the success rate for these students. The last thing I want to leave you guys with is we talk about black history. A lot of times we don't really recognize that it involves other people, coalition of will. Uh, one of the things that I find most interesting about Martin Luther King is when he crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. The first time he tried to do it, they beat the, uh, the march bloody. The second time they tried to do it, he had a feeling that it was going to be worse than it was the first time. The final time that they did it, before they did it, he used the social media at this time, television, and he gave a call to all his brothers and sisters who believed in the fight for equality. 
And by the time before they crossed that bridge, guess what? Two thirds of the, of the marches were black. A third was white. They formed a coalition of the willow, which I believe that we have here at Lone Star today, right? So I want you to think on that, right? This is everybody's, uh, this is everybody's issue. And we be proud of the fact that we can go together here at Lone Star, right? All of us are part of the solution, okay? The last thing I want to say, how do we get this done? You're going to be surprised. The internet, Google, Bing, Firefox, uh, media. So um, I don't know if you guys played the, the, the quizzes game that we had. Thank you, Black America. But I, I designed it. And when I designed it, I went down a rabbit hole finding out what Black Americans had contributed to the, the, the United States and the world. And I was blown away. And I had to stop myself. <laughs> I was like, okay, I don't think they can handle more than 12 questions, right? <laughs> like, I could have gone on forever, right? And so, you know, uh, we here at Lone Star, we believe in excellence, okay? And uh, remember, we want to go from I to the what? Okay. And the last thing I'm going to say is, we told we talked to professors, but I want you guys to take it upon yourselves. And I'm not even saying this to the I'm saying this to every, every student in this room to make yourself one, to figure out what you need from us as your professors, as your administrators to make you stay, right? In our classes, these wonderful ladies right here, we've talked to our students about every kind of problem that you can imagine. We are here. Okay, we are here for you. And we want to see you succeed. Okay? And that's all I have to say. I appreciate it, John. Thank you. Um, we have a few minutes for question Q and A session. So, first from the audience, any questions, comments? Not all at once. Where's the energy? Where's that energy? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> I first like to say, great job. This is a uh, topic. Uh, I think definitely feels like needs to be discussed. I'm not sure if you guys remember we had our convocation a month ago. Um, Dr. Jones was talking about the low retention rates and graduation rates specifically among African-American males at the school. So I think candid conversations like this push us into the, uh, the direction of possibly correcting that, uh, that issue and bridging that gap and hopefully improving that. So I definitely love what you guys are doing here. I appreciate it. Questions or comments? Yes, please. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Crystal Stabler. Um, I don't know if y'all heard, but the Student Success Institute program um, mission is to help connect students, African American students, to the campus and resources. So we already have a program like that in place, and we accept students daily. And we also have the ability to match students with faculty and staff mentors that stay with you until you graduate. So we already have a great program on campus that all you have to do is sign up and you can utilize it. And um, we advocate and we have um, events uh, monthly. Um, we help with transfer, we're able to enroll you in classes, drop you from classes, and um, we have personal meetings where you can come in and you can speak on the struggles you may be having. Um, I walk you to class, we talk, and we get personal, and so I can help you find whatever niche there is to help complete college. And so um, if you're interested in the Student Success Institute program, my office is located in LRNC 140, and you can see on the, um, on the wall, I have uh, flyers everywhere. It has a QR code, um, all you have to do is scan that, and it has questions like, hey, what are your three goals? Uh, what colleges are you interested in transferring to? And I bring them into the office and we just talk and we connect and we help you navigate through college. 
And once again, my name is Crystal Stiglitz. So if you're interested in this, um, we do have it, and all you have to do is touch base with me. Thank you very much, Mr. Stiglitz. Any other questions or comments? Someone from the chat. Yes, great. Good job. Uh, okay. Panelists, <laughs> please talk about the intersectionality and the challenges that Black women and LGBTQ students face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking about. I think I actually I recently had a conversation with one of my students last week um, who actually will help me answer this question. Um, I think again, some of those common factors that we've talked about are similar um, in that they are juggling that balance, trying to figure out how to balance the schools and their responsibilities and work. Most community college students like that population are what we call commuter students. They come and they go. They have so many other responsibilities, other things that are going on with them um, and outside of this environment. And so oftentimes, again, it's a struggle, but if we can tap into, if they can come to us and have that simple dialogue or conversation, we're more than happy to help guide you and lead you to the resources that can help you. Um, Yes. I was just going to say that student wide also has student clubs that are sort of and just getting involved in them. So if you want to be, you know, spend 40 hours a week or maybe just an hour a week or whatever, as much as little, but you get to make this connection so that you feel like you belong with your faculty advisor or your students. You have that commonality. You want to understand what the reaction is to the student wide. And I think I think that yes, that's that's also important. And I think that that is another a key piece: finding someone, something within this environment that you can connect with. Um, and that's so that's so important. I know sometimes we're afraid, or we're a little hesitant, or we're afraid to dip our toe in the water, so to speak. But and I had some of those experiences too that I shared as a student. I was timid; they were taking us to Lake Geneva, and I was like, "Oh my God, I don't want to go." But once I went. I met new people. I had a completely different experience that I've ever had in my life. I made those connections, and I'm telling you guys, it's so important. Most of my students, probably, I have some of my students in my classroom uh, are in here from last semester. Most of them have made some connection with with um, in their classes. They leave out with a friendship, a relationship with somebody at the end of the semester. I even force my students, I tell them not by force, but not for the purpose of stalking anyone. I have them exchange whatever information they're comfortable with, with someone. So if a question comes up, you have an issue, you're not gonna make it to class, you're not really sure about the assignment, you can call somebody, all right? I have students, oh, so-and-so said they're not gonna be in class today. Oh, okay, they relay that message. That's important, it's very important. Supplement that um, the Black Student Union meets every Thursday in case at 3 3 10 p.m. So that's a, you know more just more specific details about that club. But again, we have an LGBTQ plus club on campus as well as student clubs that are race affiliated, ethnicity affiliated, sexual orientation, chess club, robotics club, tons of STEM clubs, clubs cater to interests, not just along. Um, certain demographical lines, demographic lines. And it's not only a way to make a connection, but also to network. Because you may end up at that same workplace or that same four-year institution with that person. You may be looking for a job in the, in the future. <coughs> Someone, you know, in that club or a year or two ahead of you. You never know where this life will take you. So however you can get that support. <coughs> this college is about, like any other college experience, it's about what you make it. And you're at one of the finest community colleges in the country. And so exploit it. You're paying the fees. Not only exploit the classes, exploit the clubs, exploit the internships, the study abroad opportunities, the honors program, internationalizing, you know, taking an internationalized course, you name it. Get everything you can out of it because you're working hard for it. 
And I encourage students to talk to your professors. We want to get to know you, right? And we want to help you address your challenges. I mean, that's what we're here for. And again, we're passionate. We're passionate about it, right? And a lot of times with our students, we always try to make a way out of nowhere. Right? Uh, a lot of times, uh, students are dealing with so many things, mental health issues. It's funny, because before I did this, I would, uh, one of my students sent me an email. You know, student uh, was trying, was saying that, uh, she, that they're struggling right now. And uh, they, I'm like, okay, but you need to come back to class to get this motivation, right? To get, uh, to, to, help, to help us make your way, get, make a way out of nowhere, right? To get the encouragement. We do one of the assignments I do in my class is called Spirit Questions. And uh, I brought that with me from, from North Harris because I thought it was just such an awesome sign. I did it last semester. And um, the students were like, Professor Burke, why didn't you give this to us soon? But the assignment allows them to identify people that try to crush their spirit and, and, and stop them from being who they are. And um, like, it's like a little paper they write. And uh, you know, you know who the number one spirit crusher is? Anybody want to take a guess? Not teachers. Teachers are number two. <laughs> so, so, so. That's number three. Who, who, was, who was the number one spirit crusher? Parents. Parents. So I guess like a lot of times when y'all come talk to us, you know, sometimes people don't have that. Uh, support system. But we, while you're in our class, we're going to be that support system. We're going to inspire you. We're going to, uh, sometimes you may need that little push or tea in the butt, you know, but we're going to give it to you. Okay, we're going to love on you. All right. And uh, that's just, that's what we do. Right. And, and so talk to your professors, get to know them as much as you can. Right. And I just feel like I'm fortunate that a lot of students have felt comfortable sharing their challenges with us. I mean, I had last semester I had a student come off and break down and cry. But I'm like, I always tell my students what my dad told me. Failure is not final. Everybody beat that. Failure <laughs> is not final. Sometimes we just have to rewrite ourselves. Professor Arastu, thank you, Professor Stuart Moore, thank you, Professor Jefferson, thank you all for coming, thank you to Dr. Jones, thank you to Joshua Estrada, thank you to Sarah Zapata, Donnie Jansen, Clay Brasher, Kelly Norton, Dean Lee, Michelle Tran, Sandra Harvey, Rob Holmes, and Cindy DeLeon Guerrero, bringing the lovely snacks and water, and thank you all for attending again, really appreciate it. Thank you.